everybody, this is your second Writer's Toolbox video and is going to focus on vocabulary and syntax. We will be returning to vocabulary and syntax throughout the year for multiple toolbox sessions, which is why it says number one. All right, let's get started. So we're going to start with vocabulary and then we'll move to syntax. Now remember that the purpose of these vocabulary words is not simply to memorize the meanings, but to actually use them in your writing. So when I'm looking over your writing from this week, I need to see at least one of these words in use. More would be better, but at least one. And then throughout the year, continue to build these vocabulary words into your writing because it will make your writing Yes, use more descriptors, and yes, replace unnecessary adjectives and adverbs with more concise and purposeful words. All right, so for our first word, it's affirmation, which means positive assert assertion and confirmation. The cat affirms that he would eat all of the hot dogs. Affirmation was given to the cat. He was the most beautiful of all. And yes, he's so cute. So affirmation is a noun. It is something that you are given or you give to someone else and it's a positive assertion. So it's a great word to add into your writing vocabulary. Next we have affable, which is an adjective, and it means easily approachable and warmly friendly. So you'll notice both of these definitions use adverbs, which we don't want. So the great thing about affable is it's a word that's more specific that can replace multiple words that are making your writing wordy. So definitely remember this one. Affable is an adjective that means easily approachable and warmly friendly. Such as the zombies found Janet affable because she gave them jelly donuts. Way to go, Janet. All right, so next up we have alleviate, which is a verb that means to relieve. I procrastinate to alleviate stress, but procrastinating stresses me out. All right, so essentially alleviate is synonymous with relieve, um, but it is a good word to know. All right, next word is altruistic, which means unselfishly generous and concerned for others. Even though George was having a bad day, he altruistically helped his friends change the spaceship's flat tire. So unselfishly generous, again, that's an adverb. Therefore, altruistic allows for you to use a more specific word for things that might need to be described in a more wordy way. So a great word to add in, altruistic, a great adjective for your characters. All right, anarchist is a noun, just as anarchy is a noun, and an anarchist is a person who practices anarchy. It's a person who seeks to overturn the established government and advocates for the abolishing of government. After the government fell to the rebels, the city fell into anarchy. There were riots, looting, and chaotic acts everywhere. So this is a very specific word, but if you're writing a story about dystopias um, and revolutions, or something along those lines, anarchy is a great word that you can use. Next word is anecdote, which is a short account of an amusing or interesting event. Chicken Jerry was not interested in Chicken Marcus's anecdote about his experiences in elevators. So anecdote is a great noun that can allow for you to describe something much more succinctly. If you're trying to describe a story that your character tells that is short and amusing, instead of using all those words, you can just say that they told an anecdote. All right, so next up we have animosity, which is also a noun, and is active enmity, which is hate, so it's active hate. The peas and carrots on Gina's plate attacked each other with intense animosity. So animosity is a noun that works great if you are trying to communicate extreme, extreme hate, all the way on the scale of hate. So it's a much more intense version of just simply hate. So it's a great word to use in order to be as specific as possible. So our next word is antagonism, which is a noun, but you can also use antagonize, which is a verb. You also have antagonist, which is a noun. But antagonism is hostility and active resistance. The fish antagonized the cat by saying, na 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 boo boo, then the cat ate him which is fair. So antagonized is when you're teasing, you're being hostile, you're humiliating others, bullying them. Um, that's antagonism. All right, so next word is austere. So in our sentence, the austere woman believes that children should be seen and not heard. So austere means forbiddingly stern, severely simple, and unadorned. So in this first one, forbiddingly stern is being used to describe the woman. But you'll notice that the second definition is somewhat different. And it works better here. The austere room had only a single couch and table. So austere can be used in two different ways to describe people and also spaces. And when you use them in those different ways, that means ultimately different things. 
Our next word is augment. After a losing season, the football team augmented their talent by drafting a star quarterback. Augment means increase, make something greater by adding to it. Now you might have heard the word augment before in reference to plastic surgery because it's used in that way a great deal, such as getting a lip augmentation when you get something injected in your lips to make them fuller. But augment can also be used outside of that connotation, such as here where the team is being improved by adding a player to it. And it is a verb. So next we have authoritarian. So authoritarian parenting styles involves parents telling their children exactly what they can and cannot do without compromise. Bummer. So they have completely dominating another's will. So authoritarian is a very specific word, but it'd be perfect in certain stories. Again, possibly about dystopia, dystopias, um, dystopian governments, um, or also just about kind of a problematic family. So keep that word in mind. It is a adjective here. All right. So autonomous. So autonomous is an adjective. The autonomous drivers decided that they didn't need roads because they had the ability to drive wherever they wanted. Way to go. And autonomous means self-governing. So it's a great adjective if you want to describe somebody who's an independent thinker. All right. Next, Nicolas Cage, my least favorite of the actors. I don't like Nicolas Cage. But he had to go through obstacles to unveil the cryptic map. I do love that word. Cryptic. Mysterious. Hidden. Secret. So cryptic is a great word that combines all of these meanings together. If you call something cryptic, it makes it seem old and mysterious and something's hidden in it and you can discover something through it. Uh, so cryptic is an excellent adjective. Next we have the word cursory, which means casual, hastily done. The student took a cursory glance at this difficult homework and decided Decided not to do it. Uh oh. So cursory again. It combines all of these words. It's an adjective that means to do something quickly, but also carelessly. Uh, so it has a very exact meaning that can make your writing more specific. Next up, we have curtail, which means shorten or reduce. After numerous accidents, the police curtailed the speed in the parking lot. So it is a verb that you can use. Next up, we have decorum, which means propriety propriety, orderliness, and good taste and manners. It is a noun. There was great decorum in how he ate his food. His elbows were always off the table. Again, this is a very specific word, but if you're writing about um, the Victorian period in general, or if you're writing about kind of a very wealthy family and they're at a dinner table and it's very tense, you can bring in this word decorum and be much more specific about what's going on. So next word we have is digression. So digression is wandering away from the subject. So in class, if I'm talking about something, but then I digress by talking about another story that's not exactly on topic, that's a digression. So a digression is a noun, and it's a good one to have in your vocabulary um, because it can describe very specific uh, conversation styles and rambling of your characters. So next we have diligence. Benjamin Franklin stressed that without diligence, any task would fall up, will fall apart. And it's a steadiness of effort, persistent hard work. So it is a noun, and it's a noun that you can use to describe the actions of a very responsible character. So diminution. When drawing perspectives, the vanishing point causes the diminution of the lines. So diminution is lessening, reduction in size. So as a car drives off into the horizon and disappears over it, you could say the diminution of the car. All right, discerning. While grocery shopping, Tony discerned that the new produce packaging was not necessary. So true. So discerned is mentally quick and observant, having insight. It's a great adjective used to describe characters who are quite bright and quick and witty. And that's it for our vocabulary. So make sure to use those in your writing. Please, please, please. I'll be looking for them. So next, let's talk about syntax. We're going to look at two different types of sentences. The first one is one that you are definitely familiar with. It is the simple sentence. And a simple sentence has a subject and a verb, and that's it. The tiger growled. Subject is the tiger, growled is the verb. It describes only one thing, idea or question, and it only has one verb. It contains only an independent main clause. All right, so we know a simple sentence is. Now let's go to the one that we might not be familiar with. It's called the periodic sentence. So in a periodic sentence, the dependent clause comes first, and then the independent clause follows. For example, when the mother discovered that her son had snuck out of the house, that is the dependent clause, the teenage boy lost all of his social privileges. That's the independent clause, and it comes second. 
So you know this is an independent clause because it can stand alone. The teenage boy, subject, lost, verb, all of his social privileges. This is a complete sentence. It can stand alone. Here, when the mother discovered that her son had snuck out of the house, what? What happened? When this happened, what happened? We can tell that it gets cut off and therefore it's a dependent clause. It depends upon the independent clause. And for a periodic sentence, we start with the dependent clause and go to the independent clause. The sole purpose of a child's middle name is so he can tell when he's really in trouble. That's not right. Ignore that one. I hate that. All right, but yes, this one's correct. So let's look at some more examples. Despite heavy winds and nearly impenetrable ground fog, the plane landed safely. Dependent clause, or independent clause, dependent clause. After an immense amount of time waiting in the hospital, dependent clause, the doctor told us the news. Independent clause. Suddenly, for no apparent reason, dependent clause, the lovable cat scratched Sally. <laughs> Independent clause. So looking at all these examples, what is the purpose of a periodic sentence? Well, the purpose is, is that it builds suspense. Despite heavy winds, oh no, and nearly impenetrable ground fog, ah, the plane landed safely. Oh, whoo. So it creates suspense. Additionally, it allows for you to take the independent clause, which has the most important information, and place it at the end of the sentence where readers are going to remember it. You'll remember from our previous video, what comes closest to the period is what their readers remember. It's what's emphasized. So the plan landing, landing safely is what's emphasized here. I'm going to skip this one because it's blurry. Let's take a look at this one. So consider how periodic sentences is being used in here and to what purpose. In the loveliest town of all, where the houses were white and high and the elm trees were green and higher than the houses, where the front yards were wide and pleasant and the backyards were bushy and worth finding out about, where the street sloped down to the stream and the stream flowed quietly under the bridge, where the lawns ended in orchards and the orchards ended in fields and the fields ended in pastures and the pastures climbed the hills and disappeared over the top towards the wonderful wide sky. In this loveliest of all towns, Stuart stops to get a drink of sarsaparilla. <laughs> so here we have our independent clause. In this loveliest of all towns, Stuart stopped to get a drink of sarsaparilla. And everything preceding it is a series of dependent clauses. And so why? Why does the author do this? Essentially what the author does is, it, is um, he or she uh, builds this very vivid description of the town, description, 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 and then gets to the point, Stuart stopping to get a drink of sarsaparilla, and the action is so simple in comparison to the very kind of, kind of overdone description preceding it with all this fancy kind of writing style that it becomes humorous that in such a beautiful place, Stuart's like, I just need some sarsaparilla, which I think is a type of soda. So it's the idea that it creates humor in the contrast, but additionally, it also makes Stuart getting this drink the most vivid part in our memory. And that's important because he's the main character. So we see all of this background and we remember it's there, but we most clearly remember him. And that's quite important. So let's look at a second example, and it'll be our last example. In the entrances of office blocks, just outside the revolving doors, on the fake marble steps, behind which can be glimpsed internal security personnel, pompous desks, escalators, hanging gym dying torsos, are these suits. Women in suits, slightly shifty blokes, insiders, bad wearers, badge wearers, forced to taste the weather to step outside because they want to have, a, they want to, have to smoke. So I like this one because it pulls together both of our sentence styles. This first one has a lot of dependent clausing towards, um, wait, where's the, are the, oh, are these suits. So are these suits are the important parts of the sentence. It's talking about the suits. And so it builds up all of this beginning part to let us know how the narrator feels about the suits before they even introduce the suits. So when they're introduced, we feel the same way the author does. But then what I love is this simple sentence, women in suits. So the reason why we're learning these together is because they're great to use together. So with periodic sentences, because they're so long, you don't want to use a ton of them in a row because it'll be really hard to follow. But if you use a periodic sentence followed by a simple sentence, it creates this kind of 
kind of smack in the face women in suits, which is interesting because probably a lot of readers were assuming these were men. So by having this simple sentence, it shocks the readers. Very effectively used. All right, thanks, guys. Bye.